Uh, Mark, hello. Um, sorry hey. for waiting. No, don't worry, Timothy. How are you? Uh, well, I'm good as, uh, you know, uh, relatively as one can yeah. be. Uh, yes. Yeah, we are, um, you know, setting things up. I think I will turn on my video soon. I will introduce you and then um, and then you'll just give us your brilliant lecture. I apologize in advice, you know, if the turnout is not um, very high because our students right now, uh, some of them, uh, you know, they're they're engaged in volunteering, they're doing stuff. Mm -hmm. so, but we will post this on YouTube, so later they will yeah. they, they will watch it. No worries. I mean, I'm 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 the one who uh, you know is honored that uh, uh, you know I can do this, and it's uh, it's uh, the least I can do, right? To uh, anyway, is a way of giving a voice uh, to Mofi. So uh, absolutely, we we really appreciate it, and I will. I will stress it in our in my short introduction, but in fact, uh, you were the first one to contact us. Yes, so we do contact a lot of people, and they're very kind. They, you know, they they all agree to participate, but you were uh, the person who addressed us. So, and we appreciate it. Oh, and it's just uh, it's 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 what happened to be the the choice in front of me, and I'm happy I did it. Thanks. I, I will wait for a couple yes. minutes, I guess. Uh, we just need to set up a um, few things with our IT guys. And yeah. yeah, just bear with me and I will introduce you. And yes, will yes. Keep this rolling. And uh, so mm -hmm. you will tell me when to turn on the uh, screen, right? Or the, do I have to? Or you tell me, I'm okay with it. Uh, I think our IT guy is now add in this option so for instance i cannot turn on my video now but once okay. i can do it this also implies that you will be able to do your stuff as yeah, well of course oh, of course no worries yeah, yeah. okay so see you now uh, the video is here i think you can yes. turn on your video and hey. uh hey hey uh you, you can try you can try the um, share screen and option now and if it works yeah yeah uh, sure i i can okay. do that and uh let me just uh uh, find it. I, it was with me before. Uh, can, uh, I had so many things open at the same time. Here you go. Uh, I can, yes, I can understand. <laughs> you can relate. Yes. Uh, so, I ha, question to you uh, uh, is uh, Timothy. Would you like this to be some of my presentation and then some some questions, some engagement with me? Um, how would I, you like uh, to run? Yeah. Um, also. So we set up, uh, I think, like 19 minutes, but uh, maybe, I don't know, it really depends on your availability. So it's maybe 60 minutes, maybe 90 minutes. So it's it would be best if you can start with a lecture. And sure. then I will uh, either ask questions myself, or I will yes. moderate Q&A by reading questions from the chat. Uh, my friends are helping me. We're also checking Facebook page. Some people can post okay. on, on the Facebook page. Sounds yeah. Good. So, so you can, try, to you can try the share screen. Yeah. Yeah. If I can, um, here we go. Can you see the slides? Yes, I can see the slides. And yeah. uh, great. So I think we're ready. Just give me, you know, this um, one minute of formal introduction, and then I will pass the word to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to stop the share now, or that's uh, no? It's it's fine. Okay. It's fine. Let okay. people can adjust, you know, they can watch. And also, uh, when we upload uh, the video on the YouTube, we will cut it. Um, so people are not going to be bothered by our chat, you know. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, let me just uh, one sec. If, before sure. you start, uh, I'm just making sure I have the right file. Uh, I don't know how to stop. Okay. Of course, now I'm the one that gets stuck with this top and share. Uh, one second. I lost my, my mouse, my cursor, so I don't know how to uh, stop the share from my side. Do you think you can uh, try to stop? Oh, here it is. I got it. I got it. Uh, sorry, just one sec. Yeah, I can sure. try the right template. Absolutely. Um, I want to actually write uh, uh, one thing that I saw um, in uh, on 
uh, on Twitter, which is yeah, uh, Global Minds for Ukraine, mm -hmm. and use it as um, as a hashtag on the presentation. So it's uh, absolutely that would be great. Yeah. Uh, and today is March eighth, right? Yes. March eighth, two thousand twenty-two. And of course, we're gonna write that we are in Kyiv. That's where we are. So, exactly. I'm going to, yeah, I learned something that there are two different ways of pronouncing uh, Kyiv, right? Depending on the where it's coming from. So, how yes. do you say in Ukrainian? So the way we spell and pronounce it, so it's K Y I V. Yeah, and how do you so, pronounce and, it? And we pronounce it. Kiev. Kiev. Okay. Yeah. So it's like deep E. Yes. Kiev. Yes. Uh, all right. Let me. Okay. I think I'm ready now. Uh, here we go. I just decided to do this. Okay. Yeah. Great. Good. So I'm, I'm uh, starting with the introduction. Yes. Hey. Okay. So everyone, uh, thank you for waiting, for bearing with us on uh, Facebook and on Zoom. And as always, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Timothy Brick. Uh, I am assistant professor at Kyiv School of Economics, and we broadcast uh, this lecture from Ukraine. Uh, I stay in my apartment in Kyiv uh, in um, you know, relative safety. Uh, as always, I advise to my students and co-workers and alumni if you watch us from Ukraine, uh, please be careful, listen to alarms and proceed to your shelters if necessary. You can always watch this lecture then on YouTube. Uh, and I have to say that right now, many of our students uh, volunteer and help other Ukrainians to, um, uh, you know, to deliver supplies or to coordinate displaced people uh, or, or to support army. So this can affect our attendance rate, but we will post this lecture uh, on YouTube for, for our students to watch it. This is the 13th day of the Russia's invasion. And while Russian rockets and air forces attacked civilians, hospitals, kindergartens, they also bombed universities and campuses. So this war uh, is also against knowledge and science and education. And our organization, our university, we, we want to show that uh, we stand strong and we are resilient and um, we're operational and we want to keep going, doing what we do, uh, you know, doing research and doing education. And that's why we initiated this series of lectures called Global Minds for Ukraine. Um, and, you know, our guest today is very special. Um, uh, Dr. Mark Esposito, he was the first person who actually uh, contacted us. He volunteered to give uh, his lecture, um, you know, to, uh, to comfort our students and to share his knowledge. And we are very grateful for his uh, solidarity. Dr. Mark Esposito, he's a professor, he's a best-selling author and co-founder of Nexus Frontier Tech. Uh, he he, he wrote uh, the book, The AI Republic, and he presented it on many venues. I watched his presentation uh, on YouTube at the, at the Google office, which was very interesting. And um, uh, of course, he has uh, held many academic appointments. He worked at Harvard, at Cambridge, and Arizona State University. He's a very uh, established academic, and we are very honored to uh, host him. And his lecture will be on you know, on a wider topic, which is not necessarily necessarily related to, to war in Ukraine, uh, to the Russian invasion. He will be talking about the pandemic and the post-pandemic world. But I think this is very important uh, to keep in mind that, you know, we live in this global world and we want to rebuild it to make it a better place. We have to think strategically and globally, and we have to understand how to behave in this global post-pandemic world and uh, you know we'll be very interested to learn from Dr. Esposito about his perspective on these big important questions so Mark I I'm very grateful and uh, this virtual floor is yours thank you thank you very much uh, Timofey and uh, tonight I am in Kiev with all of you 
Uh, the whole point about me uh, reaching out is that we all have one option always ahead of us to make a difference. And in my case, uh, make sure that I could do what I always do, which is lecture um, to the students of your university was, I think, normal. So uh, not only I send you uh, my support, I am there with my mind and with my soul. And, and I am, uh, uh, of course, I'm despising what is currently happening. I would have never imagined in my lifetime uh, to see a war in, in Europe. Uh, on absolutely no pretest or no reason, like there's never reason for war, but if there is a moment in which we really are struggling and understanding why this all is happening, why so much suffering. So you have my, my love, uh, all of you uh, currently going through this. And, and I have to say, Timofi, I admire so much that of the many options, the university decided that continuing to do what the mission is, is, is actually more important than hiding, because that's what people will terrorize wants us to do, right? They want to terrorize us. And the best answer is to continue to do what we do our best. So thank you for having me. Um, we, we have agreed together with, um, with Dr. Brick to uh, uh, maybe have a conversation first on, on an important topic that, as you notice, I haven't developed by myself uh, there are uh, four, three more people next to my name into uh, the conversation. I, I'm the one representing them, but uh, clearly this has been a collective effort. Uh, and what is going to be our next work, our next book, uh, which will be published by MIT University Press. But the idea is not just the book itself, it's the findings that we found as we were going through this research. And, uh, you know, I look forward uh, to the discussion that we'll have. Um, and to the question that we might uh, actually see coming uh, our way later on. So uh, if that's okay, uh, Timofi, I will start, right? You should be able to see my screen. And um, uh, first of all, why the great remobilization? Um, the, the, the input or the amplitude started right after, um, I would say the first few months after COVID when we realized that uh, the fragility of our system was so clear that we were dealing with uh, a groundbreaking moment, to some extent a watershed moment. Um, we realized that most of our institutional frameworks were actually struggling. Uh, our economic foundation were based on a stock of theory that are coming from uh, the 20th century. Uh, so I'm an economist by training myself. And I, uh, I have to uh, tell that until uh, you know, the uh, modern monetary policy from Stephanie Kelton, very little was really added to the conversation in economics. We were heavily relying on a body of work that still made a lot of sense in academia, in uh, the practice and in policy that was coming from uh, uh, the last few decades. But um, the events in 2020 until now really demonstrated that we could not um, uh, just depend greatly on those foundations anymore. We had to think that this next few years, the decade from 2020 to 2030 will be a foundational change from what we actually are currently imagining. So that's kind of to give you a bit of a sense of where we started this conversation. The great realization is uh, rethinking how are we engaging at the public policy level, how we're engaging at the uh, corporate level, how we're engaging on the uh, financial level, how we're engaging on the technology level, just to give you a bit of, uh, of context um, with uh, redefining some of our tenants. Uh, there are a few things that I need to share before uh, running a few slides. Uh, the first one is uh, we are in deep need of a new narrative. Uh, the narrative we used to have uh, at the end of World War II uh, when we saw the rise of uh, the Western heritage becoming predominant with the North Atlantic Alliance was based fundamentally on two major principles, democracy and free markets. And that was also the sparkle that initiated the Cold War later on in which we could really see uh, a conscious of ideology between two different forms of narrative. The narrative based on a free world and narrative based on, uh, let's say, a non-liberal world. Um, the narrative built our economic prosperity, it built the idea that markets are driving economic activities, it built the idea that countries are competing, it generated the industrial uh, policy that really helped country go from farming to uh, uh, manufacturing all the way down to services. And it started to think that uh, the constant, uh, this constant challenge of innovation is at the same time a stressor or equally a propeller towards uh, economic prosperity. And we have seen part of uh, Europe going from poor and devastated from World War II 
to uh, uh, prosperous and rich over time. Um, we started to think about social welfare. We started to imagine universal rights. So the 20th century was a century based fundamentally on the narrative of growth that was uh, driven by the economics of free markets and the, uh, the allocation of power in democratic exercises. The 21st century does not work that well anymore with the same narrative. There's a number of reasons for that. Our increasing pressure on uh, uh, the socioeconomic fabric is leading some of the larger uh, inequality we have ever seen in history. Um, globa uh, globalization 1.0 or capitalism has been responsible for lifting millions of people out of poverty. Uh, but the purpose of taking them over and distribute them on social mobility standards to the point in which we can imagine them uh, generating equal distribution, not equal in terms of everybody the same, but distribution that has equal opportunity depending on where you are, seems to be challenged fundamentally by the way the financial markets are operating. And the rise of a financial economy on steroids, which grows uh, at least 400% larger than the real economy, started to create this unique phenomenon in which the reality of the market does not reflect the reality of people on the ground. So a number of reasons that COVID has simply exposed um, showing that our previous model was really not working. So what have we been observing in the work on the great remobilization? So first of all, uh, I'm gonna give you a bit of a poster. This is not our cover yet, but this is uh, also to show you uh, Olaf and Terence who are working with me on this. Forget the, the big test. Uh, it's actually really unfriendly to read. It just gives you a bit of a conversation about where this is really uh, going. But the smart, the, the, the great realization led to fundamentally this, which is really where I'm going to spend some of my time now. So during their research, uh, we started to notice that the entire operating system of uh, society was upgrading itself to what we call global 2.0. Now, you will notice there is an umbrella on top of it which is what we call the, uh, the cognitive era, right? This is really where a um, large part of what you were saying before, the mafia on the Arab Republic, and, and Olaf has written another book called uh, The Solomon's Code, help us to really understand that the relationship between technology and humans was fundamentally changing. It was changing because, uh, first of all, technology was no longer a means to efficiency like we tend to speculate in economics, but it was a replacing the surrogacy of value creation. The moment we were actually building automatic processes entirely driven by machines to create value, which like bypassed the principle of labor that in many parts of the world is foundational to the idea of a constitution. There are countries that basically say that their republic are based on the foundation of labor. But what happens when labor suddenly becomes uh, uh, ambiguous or blurred? We don't really have a clear cut between this. So. The cognitive era is something that we have uh, seen rising at a very faster pace. We don't consider it to be a, a specific factor by itself. We consider it to be much more of an overarching factor in which regardless that we're dealing with geopolitics and we're gonna have a conversation and I'll try to make uh, equally a reference to uh, the current uh, war in, uh, in, in Ukraine. Um, the, the conversation with technology start becoming so predominant that um, a large part of our decision-making these days are taking into account technology almost like an asset class on its own. I'm gonna give you an example and I'm gonna bring it really down to the conflict in Ukraine. One of the interesting story, interesting to the point in which you have to observe it with the eyes of history that is happening through these uh, um, events of these last few days is how technology companies became major players in the picture. Not only there were requests, for example, to stop doing business in Russia, like it has happened in many fintech banks, but equally technology companies, but also there was, and I don't know his, his name, I think it's the Minister of Digital Transformation on Twitter, ask for help to Elon Musk for having coverage of communication through Starlinks. And suddenly, interesting on that, a country like Russia hacks the Ukrainian system, but the billionaires is able to send satellite out of space to cover that. I mean, that was an interesting moment to understanding that technology today has an entirely different um, taste and, and place in our society than what we actually have ever before. Um, that's the first part of the conversation. The other part of the conversation is uh, uh, relating to how much this will redefine the foundation of work and labor. 
and how will we be capable of integrating technology for the better? Uh, one of the sentences I love uh, uh, quoting from uh, the, one of the co-founders of, uh, of Siri, Gruber, who actually said, we spend a lot of time augmenting technology. What if we spend equal amount of time augmenting humans? I think there is a clear direction towards technology augmenting humans in the next few years. Imagine the power technology give us on challenges like climate modeling and climate policy to um, helping in, uh, in uh, healthcare, uh, look at vaccines and the wonder of having vaccine after a few months from, uh, uh, from a pandemic because of the amount of work we have done in the past few years in developing technology capable of replicating um, memories inside the DNA, which is really the wonder of these vaccines. All of this is shows you that we are on the onset of one of the greatest uh, transformations. Um, if we manage this correctly, the cognitive era will be an era of equality and opportunity, equality and equity for everyone. If we mismanage this, it will become the greatest divide. Not only will it be a major economic divide, it will generate in, in incredibly difficult uh, gaps to uh, surmount, but equally economic uh, symmetries that will continue to generate more and more pressure on countries that won't have a technology know-how. So that's to give you a bit of a sense on this. When we try to bring it down to uh, the other five Cs, they happen to all start with C, you know, and, and you know this as well, uh, Timofi, right? When you are a business school professor, you start feeling a, a bit of a romance with frameworks and you come up with something that you can easily remember because that's easy. Um, so it goes for the five forces that we all learned somehow to uh, the marketing piece. And now we decided to come up with the uh, five Cs. Well, six, but let's call it five in terms of that's really what is emerging from our work. So we divide into COVID, crypto, cyber, climate, and China. And I'd like to spend some time on each one of this, um, just for you to understand where we are with this. Um, I'll do a brief overview on this, and then I'll try to go a bit deeper into that. What we think the operating system of uh, uh, the globalization 2.0 are really about to see is what we put in the book, the idea of zero principle. Now, this is a slide that uh, my colleague Olaf uh, knows much better than me. He has been working closely with the idea of zero principle. But fundamentally, to, just to give you a, a, a gist of that, uh, when we're looking at zero principle, these are principles that are creating entirely new foundations. When you're looking at first principles, uh, you're looking at principles that are generating significant forms of disruption because they fundamentally change the way we operate. But while first principle, they have an impact on an established boundary, zero principle, they are creating an entirely different set of boundaries. So imagine that you're dealing with something that is creating disruption into an X and Y axis that is within the boundary of X and Y. Zero principle, fundamentally, they change the way we are. So um, we are, I think, clearly not only in the very beginning of zero principle. I'm going to give an example, bringing it back to geopolitics. Um, even if I work in the intersection between technology, policy, and business, and in my heart, I'm much more of a political economist, at least the way I, I like to see myself. Um, in, in terms of uh, geopolitics, we are about to see in these days through the sacrifice happening in Ukraine, an entirely redefinition of the geopolitics in the 21st century. Believing that a country like Russia will ever be the same after this is actually naive. Imagine what it means like a country with the geography of Russia having an entirely different set of course that will profoundly change the uh, next few years in ways that are fundamentally zero principle in geopolitics. And so goes for many of the conversations we're having. So goes for the NATO. So goes for uh, the revitalization of the EU. There are extremely interesting moments for us uh, that are currently happening. So th this is for you to uh, uh, basically see what we saw in our work. That while we do believe there is some form of uh, specular relationship between the past and the future in some degree of anticipation of the future by looking at the present, we also started to notice that the transformation we were going through right now were not only incremental or optimal or suboptimal. We were not looking at an efficiency language. We were looking at an entirely different form of transforming value elsewhere. And that's, I think, important for us uh, to bear into account. So that's for you to have a sense. When you're dealing with zero principles, you require zero principle leadership 
uh, we are seeing this uh, in the ability to thrive and, and, and move forward in the creation of an entirely different uh, economic system, social system um, that are, are capable of understanding where this foundation are really going about. So that's to give you a bit of a sense. Back to the five C's. Why do we think this is so, uh, well, let's call it six for the sake of introducing some element onto the, uh, the cognification, but in the book, we are focusing more on the application of the five. So what do we see happening at a faster pace? Uh, I'm gonna go in and have some slides. I won't go too deep in this because what I like is to have uh, a time for questions. So in cognification, uh, what well, I think we'll see more and more, as I mentioned before, is this predictive, predictive ability for us to think about um, technology and, and society at a much more intertwined level. Uh, we see this uh, similar to the premise of the fourth industrial revolution where technology was becoming multi-domain, uh, biology, biological, digital, and physical. We see this uh, uh, building fundamentally different form of mimicking human behavior. Uh, we see this as a way for us to uh, uh, reframe uh, the role that we have as humans in society. When technology fundamentally uh, takes such a large part of the decision-making, if we use it as a mechanism of uh, supporting humans in the loop. Um, this is a, a conversation that we need to have no matter what. Um, this is not about replacing humans. This is more about understanding how do humans integrate digital components in their ability. Quick uh, note, I'm uh, connecting from Dubai where I'm currently based. Among the work that I'm doing for uh, currently with, with the government, there's the idea of rethinking jobs into the 21st century. And so there is a, there is a term that uh, my colleague Olaf has been using extensively called symbiote governance, which is the idea of how do we integrate technology into public servant jobs. That's an example where cognification will play a major role, uh, where we are redesigning jobs by taking into account digital components, by taking into account technology no longer as a means to efficiency, but technology as a form of architecture that, that largely shapes value chains. So that's to give you a sense of uh, the first C, that we so sort of like consider to be more of an umbrella. This also will create an entirely different uh, need for us to rethinking about the internet, uh, rethinking data, rethinking markets. And just to give you a bit of a sense of that, in a world in which technology become much more predominant, and I know that many of you are economic students, when we're moving from bilateral markets to multilateral markets by defining data as an asset class on its own, that will generate its own a mechanism of supply and demand. And similar like what happened with petrochemical oil and gas, where suddenly they became traded onto the market independently on many factors, sometimes independently on the currency of the country that is extracting this, by using a neutral currency like the dollars, for example, for oil. It shows you similar data likely will become an asset class on its own that will possibly uh, mushroom the idea of markets into some form of multilateral market rather than a bilateral market. So to give you a sense of context why economically, this will also fundamentally change our principle on supply and demand, pricing mechanism, a mechanism of arbitrage and all of that. The second C that we talk about is COVID. But we don't talk about COVID in terms of public health. I think we have largely talked about it in many parts of the world. We talk about COVID as a propeller of the internet in ways we've never seen before. And what this slide shows you is how much more internet traffic was really being experienced as we were kind of looking into uh, uh, the rise of uh, a larger dependency on digital. You'll notice the numbers here are quite significant. Um, it shows you that uh, ahead of us, we'll see uh, uh, internet to the next generation. Some are currently already speculating on Web3 as a different kind of internet from the web two or web one, which was historically just uh, about communication and emails. Then it became more about search and messaging. Now web three is really moving us into a different form of decentralization, which is really more about where the internet is going to go in the next few years. Rethinking access differently from before is one of the silver lining of COVID that has really provided us with an internet on steroids that has really created access to uh, um, data that we have never seen before. So we are right at the beginning of, uh, I would say almost a zero principle in moving into a different form of, uh, of quantum internet that will also be largely uh, related to energy. 
we're not talking about energy specifically right now, but energy is another of the elements that likely will be within the data sphere. Because consider the most of the technology we see today in the alternative form of energy are technology that work much closer to the internet than on the extraction of raw materials. So we will see more and more that the effort on renewables will be fundamentally a data conversation rather than natural resources and extraction or what in economics we tend to refer to as factors of production. The third C is the one related to crypto. Now, again, all of these are fundamentally critical for anyone into economics because we see this uh, change in the principle of financial transaction. Not only cryptocurrency will continue to be uh, something that we'll see. Um, I think it was news of this last few days. Uh, the President Biden was about to announce something about crypto. It shows you it's now getting into the, the, um, the, the balance of powers across countries that talking about cryptocurrency is becoming significant. Why? Because now cryptocurrency are in the size of trillions. So we suddenly have a major economic impact that we need to take into account. Um, and, you know, cryptocurrency also becoming some form of uh, a psychological safe haven right at the beginning of uh, the sanction, if you remember, with the fear of the market opening on Monday, we saw a number of people uh, largely invested into crypto. So what used to be back in the days on natural resources, namely gold, now seems to be operating on crypto. Now, there's a different conversation on that. We don't think crypto is actually a safe approach. Uh, you had a lecture with, uh, uh, with Dr. Taleb, I think openly talks about crypto as being, I think, I don't know if he ever mentioned to being a Ponzi scheme, but I don't think he's far from doing that. Um, but thinking that crypto is, is not different from, from high yield equity indexes that are by design with high degree of volatility. But more interesting than crypto for me in the crypto in the crypto conversation that is going to generate uh, the uprising institutional framework on finance is DeFi, decentralized finance. We see this more and more powered by how technology companies like fintech or tech fiends are, are driving fundamentally the difference on that. And on the distributed autonomous organization, the DAOs, where we see, for example, ledgers and blockchain driving specific processes that equally have voting mechanism in place. These are wonderful examples that if applied to things like, for example, supply chains, inventory, um, even microtransactions, they could be a wonderful or donation of charities, wonderful forms of having technologies that is using algorithms to dramatically automate some of the processes. So we see this being a different kind of a wave uh, from what, what crypto used to be at the time in which it was a challenger to the central, uh, the central structure of money. Uh, we don't even think that crypto today is about money anymore. It's much more about the blockchain technology that has, you know, has so much potential in, in redefining the storage of value because like the internet, who owns the ledgers, right? It's, it's, it's a much more open conversation. Going back to a conversation on geopolitics, I don't want to forget what is currently happening. When you're hearing of uh, Russia moving away from the internet, it shows you that this country will go into a degree of isolation that will not necessarily be able to integrate itself into any of this, which means that if uh, the effort in many parts of the world is to increase transparency, a system that is actually decoupling itself from that will become less and less transparent over time. It's really challenging to imagine what will really be in the next few years when you're just looking at this from a pure macro and geopolitical perspective. The fourth C is cybersecurity. Now, I think we started to notice this already. I'm sure you see how uh, Anonymous on uh, Twitter is announcing every time it's hacking some of the website in Belarus and in Russia. Guys, this is the reality of cybersecurity challenges right now. Uh, we have a system that um, is uh, directly rethinking security in digital format in a way that we have never seen before. Um, so um, the reason why we think cybersecurity is the center of our attention is not only because of the specific uh, characteristic of cybersecurity, but also on the se severe lack of security capability we have right now uh, for us to be able to protect ourselves. So. Uh, the estimates go into the amount of billions that every single year country are basically uh, losing because they can't protect themselves. Um, in the next few years, we imagine that the effort at the central level 
will continue to rise uh, to start building cybersecurity structures that are going to be worth it of the kind of asset we have in and the kind of equity we have in, in the digital world. So again, it's, it's a form of, uh, um, I think, um, a form of upgrading our understanding on security, considering that the large majority of the assets are now generated on digital transaction. The number five is climate. I think this is where we're going to see the rise of the, the um, uh, carbon economy at the level we've never seen before. Um, uh, dear colleague of mine, Dr. Kagram, who is the Dean of Thunderbird, uh, has a, a wonderful slide in which is, uh, shows how carbon sequestration, carbon mitigation, and cl climate adaptability are is now generating trillions of dollars in net revenue. So very likely in the next few years, we'll see economic activity uh, rising from the carbon economy. Uh, smart carbon trading, how we're rethinking carbon in supply chains, uh, how will we track emission and eventually generate a market for that? Uh, how do we do a, a cost benefit analysis? How do we understand the flow? How do we integrate in technology for us to generate the traceability required for carbon to be understood better? Uh, so we are at the very beginning of the rise of an entirely different set of economic idea around climate. And let me tell you this. A climate change as a paradigm has failed because the idea of reversibility of the climate is very naive and quite romantic. Uh, and tropic systems, systems that are naturally evolving, they don't reverse back. The question is not the reversibility of the climate. The question is the adaptability of our system to a climate that in constant, uh, in constant transformation. And that is much more of a human geography than anything else related to that. And I think the carbon emission conversation that is shaping the carbon economy today is much healthier than I think what uh, was the conversation on climate change that was working on binary system of incremental decremental by trying to reduce emissions. Yeah, clearly you can do that because in game theory, we learn that what you do if you have in a problem and two different parties with the symmetrical information, you try to minimize adversarial forces. So climate change was fun foundationally a game theory exercise that could never found an equilibrium. We think that the equilibrium is not in zero sum game, is in building entirely different economic model. They're based on carbon neutrality. I think this is fundamentally where we see the, the, uh, the fifth trend. Final, and it's not just, as they say, the last one or the least one, this is big, China. What will be the role of China as a country where data, currency, people, intellectual property, goods and services, natural resources, DNA, and today, uh, the ambiguity on with Russia continues to be a problem. Um, I'm not saying that it's a problem as countries uh, per se, but it's a country that is fundamentally challenging um, international cooperation the way we know about it. Um, it's building form of informal alternative to our system. We saw this already with the digital RMB. Uh, we see this already with uh, the creation of the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank that became the first challenger to the World Bank in 2015. Uh, we see this with the large infrastructure project that China has been running with the Build Road Initiative. And we see this with uh, the trade volume that China is increasing with Africa. Um, if for, uh, we were learning through our, one of our interview that for the 12th consecutive years, the trade volume China is exchanging with Africa is much larger than US or EU combined. So it shows you that clearly it's a country we need to understand. We need to engage. I don't think it's a country we need to directly antagonize, but it's a country we need to understand at a deeper level than what we understand right now, because uh, we clearly are not understanding what is the role of China. Neither China is making much of an effort to make that clear either. So I think clearly in the next few years, rethinking the relationship with this country uh, will be an important one because across so many different dimensions, the country is far from being neutral. And how will we reconcile from trade to data to protection to IP is really the essence of this. So what I wanted to do, uh, uh, Timofey, in this uh, time with, uh, uh, with my slides, not to bore too much our, our viewers, is to give us a bit of a conversation on where we see this eventually going, uh, where it's coming from the research we have done. Uh, we interviewed uh, over 100 uh, people, uh, some of them prominent. Um, to basically understand where we are heading. 
and nobody gave us one answer. So we had to like uh, recalibrate them into what we thought could be uh, making some form of sense. And the uh, 6C uh, with codification as the umbrella, as I bring it back uh, for us to uh, uh, basically as my, my uh, final slide, um, really represent what we see the operating system of globalization 2.0. And, and we think that around the area that I mentioned throughout uh, this uh, short uh, conversation uh, through my slides, uh, we'll see significant transformation moving forward. All of them, they are aspiring to become zero principles uh, across different dimensions. So that's kind of where the idea of the great revolution is all about. Okay? To finish on that, can we build a world that is going to uh, embrace this conversation in the right way? Rather than expecting that will happen for us, can we rethink it more proactively? So we're becoming uh, what we call design activists and directly, act, directly designing this infrastructure, this institutional framework, these ideas, these theories. And I'll finish on this, uh, Timothy, right? Um, you know, myself, I've been uh, trained with the stock of theory coming from the 20th century that are my legacy and my heritage. And I honor them. They gave me an opportunity to think and to choose my uh, conceptual frameworks. But we need theories of our own in the 21st century because we're facing challenges that we have never seen before in a combination that no other uh, you know, civilization have ever seen before. I'm not saying we're special as a generation, but we have our own package of problems that we need to address. And I think resorting to the past to understand the future in this case might not take us very far. So that's to give you a bit of uh, context. I'm gonna stop my share, uh, Timofi, and I look forward to our conversation. I hope it makes sense. Sure, wow, well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, it was such a, uh, you know, uh, deep, uh, deep lecture and you presented everything the from game theory to qualitative sociology yeah so uh that was excellent uh i had written several questions while uh, i was following your uh presentation sure. but i think i will start with the last one uh because it is a very intriguing one yeah you, you provoke us to think about these new challenges and searching for new conceptual frameworks and theories and of course this is so difficult because how can we how can we do it yeah we have socialized in certain world intellectual traditions and it's uh, and we're trapped there yeah so it's so difficult to to develop these new conceptual frameworks and you also have emphasized that the role of china is significant now and it will be even more significant in the future so maybe one of the you know um, ways of uh, thinking about our future would be uh, to borrow some intellectual tradition from this country, you, you know, like to understand yeah. their culture better, their intellectual tradition. How do they see the world? Try to understand them and also try to adjust. Not not necessarily adjust, but at least to, to get some inspiration from them. Or maybe you believe that this uh, poses certain threats uh, in a way that you, you have said yourself that China poses certain challenges to the world. So maybe adjusting our worldviews to their tradition um, could be wrong. So can you somehow speculate about it, about yeah. you know uh, the opportunity to learn from them but also to be careful with what how how far can we go yeah Timo, that th thanks for this uh, wonderful uh, way to start um the way we see this is that china started to decolonize itself from the west mm -hmm. and there was a time where china was going after the western icons right the western brands and all that and, and i think over the years uh, a bit of a uh, uh, combination between the Cultural Revolution that happened that brought the Communist Party to power to the fact of the, the one, you know, one party system um, that, of course, believes in surveillance and control as an only way for uh, the degree of complexity you have in a country like China. We start to notice the rise of Chinese uh, alternatives to the Western ones. And over time, if you have generation of people that are born only exposed to that, uh, you kind of get allow me the term, indoctrinated into a Chinese way of thinking. I have a friend called uh, Ted Sun who wrote a book about 10 years ago called Inside the Chinese Mind. I think we really have, Timothy, to go inside the Chinese mind to understand. You know, it, back in the 1950, 
no matter whether you were American or not, you had to understand the Americans to understand the way the world was about to be designed, right? We had to, all of us became colonized to the American idea one way or the other, because we had to. I think it's the same now. We have to get closer to the Chinese way of thinking for us to understand where this country is currently having and going. And what you said is correct. Can we borrow ideas? Can we work with them? You know, I always find that in the uh, ability to have a conversation between a, with, with, a, with a, uh, a party, you can say my way versus your way. You can say, can we create a third way that is reconciling some of this? So I think there is a, a, one of the comments that we learned uh, from uh, Parakana, who is uh, somebody that we know, and we know his work. He said, the world is, com is converging in a number of different ways, but is culturally divergent as well. Because of subculture, tribalism, we have to, I think, make a step towards integration somehow. Because thinking that we'll ever be able to simply antagonize China, that's not going to go working. So I think moving closer and understanding is really, and let me finish with this, the way we have been colonized to the American principle, the Western principle for most of our 20th century, we have to colonize ourselves, you know, intellectually also to the Chinese principles, not because we have to embrace them, but because we have to understand them. Right? I think that's, that's clearly one area mm -hmm. of uh, intervention. Yeah, I, uh, I can't stop cannot help myself but thinking about you know Russia and Ukraine now and I, I, I think a lot of intellectuals also have noticed uh, that this desire or maybe um, attempt to understand Russia uh, by Western intellectuals has also created sort of um, romanticized narratives of Russia yeah and and some people were lured into these romanticized narratives uh, yeah. so I think, this can be also a powerful um, example to all of us. So, you know, to build some uh, boundaries, yeah, when we want and, and to, un to have this clear strategy, whether we want to understand someone, appreciate someone, uh, uh, you know, have some cultural exchanges, but not to get lost into uh, narratives and uh, romanticized uh, ideas, because it could be. Uh, yeah, it could be dangerous. It could be dangerous Absolutely. for our national security. Well, Timofey, you, you are experiencing the, the price of having underestimated the narrative in the way it should have been. You know, and that's a critique to, uh, you know, the West for the last 20 years. We have fundamentally misunderstood Russia. Yeah. On the contrary, we were thinking that uh, Russia was uh, leaning towards the West, uh, not understanding that it was never a lean into words, right? It was uh, creating leverage. Mm -hmm. I think um, across so many different U.S. presidents as well, we have seen so many mistakes from uh, Clinton to uh, George Bush to, uh, to some extent, even Obama, right? Um, Trump, uh, for us to really not having understood that thinking behind. I think country like Ukraine, this conversation could have never been so easily done because you have the historical context to understand Russia better than other parts of the West, right? But outside of uh, that context, we were all romanticizing, as you say, with that. I think, again, we cannot uh, afford the same mistake with a country like uh, uh, like China. I think we have to remember, and, and uh, I know I'm using this because I know in, in academic terms, we have the ability to be intellectually free, right? Russia is economically quite inconsequential, but it's uh, just because it's a military power. If it wasn't for the military power, a country like Russia would constitute roughly 3% of the global GDP. So it's actually Russia with 145 million people as the same GDP of a country like Spain. And with the devaluation of the depreciation of the ruble, likely a country becoming like Portugal, I think it was the same Taleb who wrote it on Twitter. So we, we, we had to imagine that the economic dissonance of a country like Russia is compensated exclusively by the military cap capabilities. And I think this is a mistake that we have made by thinking that just because it's a country with a relatively modest economic condition, it doesn't necessarily uh, build the threat. And last on this, haven't we really paid a high price on underestimating the conversation of dependency on energy right now? Eastern Europe today understanding that if you are dependent by 50% of your energy intake from a country, that by itself is economic fallacy, right? 
But anyway, can you imagine the number of people who got elected on the promise of having more affordable energy? But that's really it's sleeping with the enemy, so to say. Yeah. Absolutely, I, I agree. But also, it brings me, you know, to the next question. I think Please. it's a nice segue because um, you have also mentioned this idea of new types of leadership um, in this world, and I want to ask you uh, maybe it's about some specifics because we live in this very complicated global world with these large-scale, complicated international organizations, you know, like European Union, NATO, mm -hmm. and sometimes these organizations, you know, they can be slow in their response and reaction to, to growing challenges. And obviously, mm -hmm. we have these decentralized uh, academics and intellectuals and businesses who, who have this alarm system, you know, they, they see new challenges, new opportunities, and they, like, you do, you, you talk about them in, um, in your lectures, in your books. And also you have said that you advise uh, to governments. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, I imagine that it's very difficult to, to have this, you know, to, to manage these quick changes, how to leverage leadership in this world, which is so much regulated. Yeah, I, uh, and I, I think a lot of Europeans uh, also have experienced this negative um things with populism you can say yeah. that populists are people who take uh, <laughs> leverage and who propose this dramatic radical ideas how to change world and then everything collapses so mm -hmm. europeans and americans they have built the system to protect against wild crazy ideas on the other hand we want wild and crazy ideas to be heard and to elevate up to the you know top offices yeah. So is there any practical solution? How can we build the system? Maybe we should create one more organization that will be called International Office of Crazy Ideas. Maybe <laughs> we should uh, have some advisory boards uh, or maybe, uh, I don't know, we should trust, uh, not just trust to intellectuals, but have some offices with them. I, I don't know. Can you share your yeah. experience, uh, how you advise to governments and whether you, you and your colleagues have these ideas, how to practically implement uh, the structure of leadership. Yeah, that. Uh, thanks for this. Uh, uh, that's a complex question, so I'll, I'll try my best with your question, uh, Um I think what governments lacks is the ability to pivot and experiment policy to the point in which you can learn about policy and policy failure, policy fallacy, assumption. You know, we have this uh, very... Uh, static view that there is an input, which is the policy, and there is the output, which is the expected outcome. And of course, policy are non-linear. So I guess it starts by understanding if we accept that complex system with large degree of interdependency are non-linear, we start rethinking that success rate is not based in setting the policy. Success rate is based on approximating the policy to what you're trying to achieve. That means that building what a colleague of mine called Landry Sikne calls agile governance is really the essence of the future of the government, uh, Timofi, in the, in the years to come. Can we think of government in an entrepreneurial format? And I think, put it this way, a private investors understand return on investment. You know, we teach this in, in many courses we teach in, in uh, universities. But government don't, doesn't have the idea of return on public value in the same way. So I think if we are able to understand that return on public value happens by taking risks, then those crazy ideas can be eventually pivoted, tried. And how do we see this happening in practical terms? We're looking at country like that we all talk about, right? From Singapore to Israel to the UAE, now to some extent, some part of the Saudi government to country like Estonia that did not exist before 1989, where I happened to know uh, Ilves at the time I was at the World Economic Forum, or a country even like Finland, right? Uh, what they do, they fundamentally experiment, and they experiment without feeling that experimentation is a form of stigmatization or failure. So if we can see how this small country have been able to largely experiment, we understand that the role of government in the 21st century is not static and based on centralized ways of operating. It's much more decentralized, territorial, flexible, to some extent not symmetrical because it's quite normal, but very agile and capable of learning from the experience how to move the, the, the policy. 
I, I would say that fundamentally is where I see this. These are some of the examples we see currently running. And um, Ilves, uh, the former president of Estonia, has an anecdote. Says, you know, it was the time in which Estonia was trying to integrate e-government. How do you do this? Well, he was able to say, how many times do we fill up the form, and what is the cost for us to do that? So the moment we're able to convert traditional behavior into an economic cost, you can eventually try to remove the cost from the balance sheet. So rethinking, I guess, uh, processes for government in a way that are going in the direction of what we need, likely we'll see the rise of uh, more innovative and radical ideas emerging. It goes from small things like technology, but uh, you know, Michael Porter, who, with, with whom I have worked at the time I was at Harvard, um, wrote something in 2017 called Why uh, Politics is Failing in America. And his fundamental argument is that politics is failing in America for the lack of competition, because basically he's a Democratic Republican, do not represent the majority of Americans, right? Either the majority of the intellectual capacity of the country like the US has, right? So I think these are where we have to experiment governance, voting, technology agile uh, governance, uh, and eventually moving government into return on public value. And um, I, I feel you, I, I think this is a very powerful statement that I have to share my own experience. You know, I, I was a bit uh, hesitant myself and maybe a bit uh, stubborn to, to appreciate uh, these ideas. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, I think, you know, the whole world is watching and the whole world now knows our president Zelensky, but at the very beginning of his uh, appointment of his office, a lot of, you know, intellectuals and technocrats were very skeptical about him because he was uh, rather perceived as a populist with a lot of crazy yeah. ideas. And somehow he, you know, uh, grew up to be a political leader who does experiments and many of these experiments uh, have succeeded uh it's a, it is a thin line yeah it's um uh maybe this is just a combination of many idiosyncratic processes so i'm yeah. not sure how to scale up this experience and to 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 advise to other governments but i hope we will be able to document very well everything what was happening in ukraine you know to build up some some uh, advice uh, from that. Uh, yeah, um, you know, one, one interesting thing I was reading at the very beginning of the war uh, was the number of uh, technological invention coming from Ukrainian startup founders, right? It's huge. And these are not small companies. Some of these are multi-billion companies. I guess as a byproduct of that culture, uh, Timothy, that's why you have an innovation in Ukraine faster than what you have it in, in neighboring Russia, right, in that case. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So it's uh, it's a combination of many factors that what you just said, but also, um, yeah, it's it goes deeper in culture as well. So I'm a sociologist, so I believe in this um, you know uh, combination of institutions and culture. I know that a lot of economists don't really uh, like this term because of it's in, uh, not very tangible and uh, and it's more like an error terms in your uh, regression models. But I, yeah. I but I still. Uh, believe that there is something there you know in this modus of behavior and templates and and how people um transmit certain behavior over generations and i, I think you, there is something very deep in ukrainian culture this idea of horizontal society which does not always trust to their leaders but knows how to organize with neighbors and partners and create coalitions and shift these coalitions so and i think this has helped our society to be resilient in the times of crisis yeah however yeah. i'm not sure whether this is a sustainable strategy in the period of stability yeah it, it helps you during the crisis but it does not really help you during the stability so right. we need to learn how to build this balance and it brings me maybe to my final question uh, sure. i don't see anything in the chat but I know, I think it's enough to have these several questions between us. So you were talking about, you know, building these new economies, including smart um, uh, smart economies uh, related to carbon energy and uh, climate change. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. Of course, right now, Ukraine uh, suffers a lot and the war is here on our land. But I have been optimist all, all my life. And, and I like to think about best case scenarios. So in the best case scenario, Ukraine survives this war. 
Uh, I imagine there will be some massive economic support to Ukraine. Uh, we can think about, you know, South Korea scenario yeah. or post uh, Second World War Europe. Yeah, so there will be some infrastructure support, financial support. And I think it's necessarily immediately at, at this stage to think how to design new economy. Yeah. So maybe you can make some bullet points like what would you like to see in this new economy which is going to be built from the scratch you know i think yeah. ukraine will be a great playground for experiments and maybe you can advise several uh points that should be that we should note and and try to yeah. implement while building things uh, from the scratch so i'm happy you're asking this uh, uh as your last question i i think uh, thinking about the future this way give us the power of, of imagination right that is important so I think there is a number of different things that comes to my mind. The first one is, uh, uh, of course, uh, rethinking energy in a different way. Uh, the carbon economy, economy pushes us to think of energy as a way of empowering people to have energy, not as a way of controlling energy because of limited supply. So I think, uh, you know, I would like to imagine Ukraine playing a major role in rethinking a carbon economy that works for energy without the uh, consequential geopolitics of energy that we had, no matter if you are Russia, if you are the petrochemical countries who are extracting oil and gas. The second thing, considering the geography and considering that it's likely that Ukraine is on a path to a EU membership or something like that. You know, it's, it's so like difficult to imagine this will not necessarily happen in the future, right, Timofi? I think the country demonstrated that it's more European than, than some of your other European countries, right? Um, I think that will create maybe an opportunity for um, supply chains, considering the fact that Ukraine was a major trade partner in many ways. We, I was reading about the relevance of wheat and other kinds of grains that Ukraine is pushing uh, across the world. Rethinking about uh, um, what we call in our book at the smart data supply chain, we start, start thinking about supply chain by using technology to optimize the process. Um, and I, I think it would be fantastic because of the, the natural geography that serves the north, the center, and the south, uh, which is actually it's a major region that needs uh, reforming. Um, it's also a region that needs reforming in light of uh, a different kind of infrastructural project that is coming from China, uh, which I think uh, is not necessarily going to be fully compatible to other ones. So I, I consider it to also be a way of generating leverage. Um, the last uh, uh, you know, way for me to see this is uh, rethinking um, decentralization, uh, decentralized autonomous organization, decentralized finance as a form of empowering the many small, medium enterprise Ukrainians that will actually need to rebuild the country. But, you know, back in the 50s, you rebuilt the country by physically building. Rebuilding the country now is empowering the millions of Ukrainians, no matter where they are to build organization that will work um, because of the access we're gonna have with technology. So the same power of decentralized ledgers or structures is really what will define grassroots movement that likely will generate value. And that will mean that we are going to outgrow the physical boundary of what the country can be all about. I think if we are focusing on these three area among the many that we have, um, the future definitely is Ukraine at the center of important conversation that can really lead the way. And, you know, there is one thing for sure, as sad as what is currently happening, uh, clearly one country will continue to be isolated for years to come. Sanctions don't disappear over time and sanctions are not just about sanction, it's just about, um, you know, redefining the space that a given country has in the world uh, order. And if there's a country that definitely has grown in, in size on a global level, it's a country like Ukraine. Right. So clearly there is a role that Ukraine must play because Ukraine has been able to do what country would have never envisioned Ukraine to do. Right. And therefore, you know, that comes with the responsibility also in the reconstruction. Yeah, thank you. And by the way, just when you were um, saying that one question appeared in the chat. OK, so I will, I will uh, read it. Sure. Um, OK, so it's. Uh, the question energy. comes from Aaron. Yeah, it's about energy. How should we look at energy independence in the future? Uh, I think you have covered this question already, but maybe you can just uh, reiterate yeah. some of the key key yeah. points from your 
perspective? Yeah, so Arun, I, I love your question, especially the part you say about, you know, over evangelizing solar. I think you're right. We have been over evangelizing because that's all we have to start with. Um, I guess, Arun, the question will be building portfolio of energy in which we can see multiple energy part of a portfolio in the same way as the best way to hedge risk in finance was to have a portfolio of investments, right? Not because you're depending on one, but because the, co the, the collective performance is larger than the individual performance of any given energy supply. So I think there are opportunity for us to think of energy as uh, more of a, a portfolio, so to say. Why am I uh, optimistic about my answer? Because if you're looking at who has been driving uh, green or clean energy in the world, it's been fundamentally the technology companies. They acquire energy for themselves because they have huge energy expenditures, but uh, they also are playing or toying with the idea of getting into the energy market. So if energy becomes a platform, if we basically make it a form of uh, greed, not necessarily uh, dependence on the extraction itself, I think energy will become part of a, a data transaction. And I think maybe that's a way to not necessarily bypass. I don't think the idea is bypassing, the idea is to integrate and embrace. You know, I finished in this room, the idea is to expand the pie, not necessarily to replace it. Because uh, I, I think that's where we are making mistakes in terms of understanding, can we do that? Of course, we can do it if the concept is about replacement, but we can do it if the concept is about expansion. And I think that's really where the thinking goes, in my, in my humble opinion. Okay, hey, thank you. Well, we don't have any questions. Um, I think what we can do now, maybe you can just repeat and uh, plug in your book and remind us uh, the title and you know wh when is it coming, and then I will have some closing remarks and. Of course. Continue then. So um, the book is called the uh, Gray Remobilization. Uh, it's um, a book that um, is supposed to come at the end of two thousand twenty-two. Uh, we're now going into uh, what I'm going to do is just uh, the cover of the book, if that's okay with you. Uh, not the cover, that's the poster. We don't have the cover yet, but I think it, it provides it with a little bit of mm -hmm. uh, a story, right? Um, this is, um, uh, we're going to have it with MIT Press. It's uh, coming hopefully end of the year, beginning of 2023. Um, we're now into our uh, final round of reviews with the publisher. Um, and it's uh, meant to be a book that should help from business executive to policy uh, leaders uh, to engage in the conversation. You see, uh, Timothy, we don't have the secret recipe for everything, but what we have is a groundwork in understanding um, where we think some of the major tendency will go and how we actually are calling for leadership in designing these institutional frameworks rather than expecting this to be done for us. And I guess if we can get out of the book this major takeaway, I think over two years of work on this have been worth it. Great, yeah. Um, I, I think this is a very good way to, to put it. And I like your philosophy. And uh, from my side, for closing remarks, I will also put a link um, to the chat now. Uh, so here at Kiev School of Economics, we are doing fundraising. Um, we have organized this um, fundraising page and you can donate to support uh, Ukrainian civilians um, by sending donations in, in crypto, in dollars, in European Union. Our donation fund is registered in Washington DC, so it's transparent, it's, uh, it complies with American law, uh, so you can expect some uh, exempts on your taxes. And we have raised uh, already some significant amounts, but you know, uh, when it comes to humanitarian aid and support of lives of people, it is important to donate uh, even more. So we appeal to our audience to, to donate and to support Ukraine. And uh, thank you very much for, for your time, uh, Mark. This has been a very pleasant conversation and an honor to have you. And I hope that soon, you know, we'll see you in peaceful Kiev and you, and we will invite you to our business school to, to talk pleasure. with us more. And, uh, you know, we'll walk around Kiev together and uh, we'll pleasure. have more, more pleasant time. 
I take I take that as a personal pinky. You know when uh, kids do pinky to that <laughs> yeah. promise is a promise, right? So it's a pinky, okay? And it's hopefully by the time that happens, I the book is out and maybe we can do a book talk and we can say when this book was being cooked in the oven, we were together in Kiev virtually and now we're here in person, right? Perfect. Absolutely. Let's let's do that. So thank you very much. I will disconnect thank you, thank now you. and um, so thanks for everyone who watched this. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.